man. Who is he? Where is he? Why is he here? Isolated in space and around massive matter live some several billion intelligent beings. Man. But what is his origin? Some say he evolved from the slime of the sea. Others that a god created an Adam and Eve and he was their descendant. Yet another speculates that he was brought here sometime in the distant past when the Earth was colonized by men from another dying planet. Despite the theories and speculations, the answer remains an unsolved mystery. As to where he is, that's easier. A planet 8,000 miles in diameter, located in a remote portion of a galaxy, somewhere, somewhere in infinite space. Why is he here? That too remains an unsolved mystery. Occupied by his daily affairs, he finds little time to contemplate such questions, except for those moments on a clear night, when man pauses and looks to the star-filled heavens, and in his mind stirs an unanswered question. He searches his thoughts for an explanation, a key to the faint forgotten memory of his past. And perhaps at that moment, somewhere else in the universe, on a distant planet similar to his own, somewhere on the other side of our galaxy, other intelligent beings wondered too and set out in airships on an adventure through space to search for their answers. November 2nd, 1967. Two men are driving west of Loveland, Texas. The night is clear and still. Then around 11 p.m., they have an extraordinary experience. After the object disappears, their lights come back on, the engine restarts, and they hurry to notify the police. Later, the Air Force investigates their story and 15 similar reports for concluding that a form of globular lightning was responsible for the sightings. But there are many other possible explanations. What you're witnessing is based on fact. Some will find it fascinating. Some may find it frightening. But it is all true. With special thanks to NASA and the Department of Defense for their cooperation in our search for UFOs. It has begun. Ezekiel chapter 1. It came to pass that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. They had the likeness of man. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures. 
The appearance of the wheels in their work was like under the color beryl, and their appearance in their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high, they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures were, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels lifted up. This account took place some 500 years before Christ. Other accounts very similar appear in earlier ancient writings. The Greeks and Romans also are known to have made observations of such things as phantom chariots appearing in the night sky. Records also tell us that during the reign of Charlemagne, there were many accounts of encounters with tyrants of the air and their aerial ships. These accounts so concerned Charlemagne that those reporting such strange phenomena were subject to torture and death. Here is one recorded event given between the 8th and 9th century in France. One day, among other instances, it chanced at Lyon that three men and a woman were seen descending from these aerial ships. The entire city gathered about them, saying that they were magicians sent by Charlemagne's enemy to destroy the French harvest. In vain, the four innocents sought to vindicate themselves, saying that they were their own country folk and had been carried away a short time since by miraculous men who had shown them unheard of marvels. Luckily, the Bishop of Lyon pronounced the incident as false, saying it was not true these men had fallen from the sky, and what the town folks said they had seen there was impossible. The people believed what their good bishop said, rather than their own eyes, and set at liberty the four ambassadors from the ship. The date was November 12th, the year 1887. The time was near midnight aboard the sailing ship Siberian when it was reported that several people aboard ship witnessed a huge sphere of fire. It was observed arising out of the ocean. It rose to an altitude of 16 meters, then flew against the wind and came close to the ship, then dashed off toward the southeast. This sighting lasted a full five minutes. Within the years 1896 and 97, mysterious airships were reported all across the United States. In Oakland, California, a group of streetcar passengers reported a winged cigar that sent out a stream of bright light. The sighting spread through Colorado, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and many other states, particularly in the Midwest. On April 11, 1897, Walter McCann of Rogers Park, a few miles north of Chicago, took a photograph of an airship. The New York Herald, as well as the Chicago Herald Tribune, pronounced the plates as being genuine and not a fake. Dr. Jacques Vallée, international authority on the UFO experience. The first thing I'd like to dispel is a frequent misconception that UFOs are limited to this country. Very often people ask me, how come I never hear about UFOs in other parts of the world? How come we only hear about UFOs in America? Well, UFOs are not an American phenomenon. They are a worldwide phenomenon. That's one of their most dramatic characteristics. The first major wave of sightings, and sightings tend to come in very intense series over a couple of months, over a given region of the world. The first such major wave occurred over Scandinavia in 1946. There was a major wave in this country in 1947, mainly in the Western states. And then there have been waves in the US in 1950, 1952, and so on. And there have been intense concentrations of sightings in Africa, in Latin America, in Mexico, in the Soviet Union, in the People's Republic of China, Australia, New Zealand, and on and on and on. I don't know of any single country that has not had a series of UFO sightings. May 1975, Manitoba, Canada. Unidentified flying objects have been reported over the small town of Carmen. The objects have been seen by many witnesses over a period of several weeks. May 13, 1975, cameraman Alan Carr of station CKY in Manitoba photographs two separate sightings over Carmen 
in front of four witnesses. The first sighting occurs at approximately 10.30 p.m. The object appears to be stationary just above the ground. Then, almost simultaneous, with a flash which appears in the sky, the object moves north at blinding speed. Only when the film is later analyzed in slow motion does Carr realize what he has captured photographically. Approximately an hour later, a second sighting occurs. The object appears over a group of trees and moves from left to right at an apparently low relative altitude to the horizon. Again, slow motion analysis provides a fascinating study of this unexplained event. On June 30th, 1973, Jean Bigot of the Astrophysical Institute flew over Chard aboard the Concorde packed full of scientists and scientific apparatus at 17,000 meters altitude in the twilight of a total eclipse. Mr. Bigot photographed the horizon with his camera. When the photo was enlarged, one of the slides showed what you're now seeing. If you look closely at this photograph, it resembles exactly what has been sighted by many Americans during 1973 and 74. Although NASA takes no official position as to the UFO phenomena and their probable explanation, nevertheless, there remains on the record several unexplainable sightings by Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab astronauts. The first sighting occurred during Gemini 4 in June of 1965. Astronaut Jim McDivitt suddenly spotted a cylindrical object with arms and antenna. And when seen against the day sky, it appeared white or silvery. The object then appeared to be moving toward the craft. Suddenly, they lost sight of it. During the sighting, the astronauts were able to take these photographs and movie films of the UFO. Gemini 5, later that year, after three days and five hours into their mission, were contacted by Houston Control Center advising the astronauts that Houston had picked up and was tracking another object, which was pacing Gemini across the entire United States. They estimated the UFO between 2,000 to 10,000 yards from the craft and as large as the Gemini craft itself. Because of the limitations of viewing area aboard their capsule, no visual contact was made. Radar continued to track the object until they passed the Ascension Islands in the Atlantic. It then disappeared. Gemini 10 crew, Collins and Young, picked up objects traveling together in orbit. A positive identification has to date not been made. This photo was taken during the Gemini 11 flight on the 18th revolution, 27 hours and 47 minutes after liftoff. September 13, 1966, this UFO was tracked visually and recorded on film by the crew and is truly considered unidentified by the photo interpretation experts at NASA. Perhaps the strongest and most spectacular of all the sightings took place aboard Apollo 11 on its way to the moon for the first moon landing. The ship was one day out on July 16, 1969, when they spotted an unusual object. It had a sizable dimension to it. At first, the crew thought it was the Saturn IV booster rocket and called Houston for confirmation. Houston informed them the booster in question was some 6,000 miles away. The object remains unknown. During the Skylab 3 second manned flight on the 23rd day of 1973, at sunrise, a series of four exposures were made by the crew of a visually sighted unidentified flying object, or satellite, as considered by the NASA Photo Interpretation Laboratory the Skylab crew noticed a large star-shaped object brighter than a planet or star. They watched it for about 10 minutes. They estimated its distance as from 30 to 50 nautical miles from Skylab. It, too, remains an unknown, despite North American air defense and NASA's attempt to identify it. Among the thousands of military men in recent times who lost their lives while in the service of their country, the circumstances surrounding Captain Mantell's death are indeed extraordinary. This experienced military pilot who'd flown in the invasion in Normandy and numerous missions over the Rhine under heavy attack would take with him to his death perhaps the closest glimpse of what was thought to be a UFO. The date is January the 7th, 1948. 
The time is 2 o'clock in the afternoon here at the Gardner Air Force Base, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. A Kentucky state policeman calls in to report what he has sighted. It's, it's an unusual aircraft, circular in appearance, uh, approximately 250 to uh, 300 feet in diameter. I'd say it's moving westwardly at a pretty good clip. Any information? Negative. I will check with our commanding officer. Instructions were given to contact nearby Wright Patterson Air Base to see if they had any experimental aircraft up in that area. Flight test, we have no experimental aircraft in the area. The reports still continued to come in from adjoining towns. At 1.45 p.m., it happens. It's very white and looks like an umbrella. I don't know what it is. Through the binocs, it appears to have a red border at the bottom at times and a red border at the top at times. At approximately 2.30 p.m., a flight of Air Force P-51s come into view. The base commander decides to contact the flight leader, Captain Mantell. This is Godman, base commander. Roger, Godman Tower. This is NG-869, flight leader, over. NG-869 from Godman Tower. We have an object out south of Godman here that we were unable to identify. We'd like you to take a look for it. Roger, I will take a look for you if you give me the correct reading. Mantell moves ahead of its wingman. The tower advises the flight leader to correct his course five degrees to the left to 210 degrees from Godman Tower. Godman Tower, this is flight leader NG-869, Captain Mantell. Object traveling at half my speed and directly ahead of me and above, and I'm closing in to take a good look. Can you give us a description? It appears metallic and, and to be of tremendous size. I'm going to 20,000 feet. The other pilots level off under 15,000 feet and start down. At approximately 3.15 p.m., Godman Tower loses sight of the UFO. Five minutes later, the report came in that Captain Mantell's plane had crashed. He was found dead. His watch had stopped at 3.10 p.m. that afternoon. What was it that caused this experienced pilot to become intrigued with an object that he would unwittingly give his life pursuing? Six months later, a cylindrical-shaped object giving off a phosphorescent glow was to be sighted in the night sky over Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. At 2.45 a.m., Captain C.S. Childs and First Officer J.B. Whitted were piloting a routine Eastern Airlines flight number 576 from Houston to Atlanta. When Whitted reports, we sighted an object coming toward us. This strange object had a stream of red fire coming from its tail. And I could see it was much larger than anything I had seen or read about. Childs then notices that the object had no wings supporting it. It passed us on the right side. Its speed was about 700 miles per hour. And both men get a very good look at this unusual object. It was about 100 feet long, shaped like a cigar. As it passed, they clearly saw two rows of windows, an upper and lower, that were large and square. During that evening, there was a third witness the one passenger who was awake on that Eastern Airlines flight, Clarence McKelvey. I was startled, frightened. A male steward came to me and said, I notice you've been looking out the window. Will you talk to the pilot? And I said, well, of course. The pilot came down with his clipboard. He was visibly shaken. He told me that he had been a flyer in the war and had covered so many million miles a flight and had never seen anything like this before. What was it that I saw? Well, I saw this object, it was cigar shaped. It had a row of windows. Behind them, it was lit. Out of the rear was a cherry red flame. This hair raising experience was witnessed by three aircraft, a passenger, and ground observers added more corroboration. The conclusion of an air intelligence report was that the object remains unidentified as to origin, construction, and power source, and goes into the record classified as unknown. This is the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. And this man is Colonel Bill Coleman. He was chief of public information for the United States Air Force from 1969 to 1974. It was here at the Pentagon that the Defense Department first became interested in the UFO phenomenon. This occurred in the late 1940s. 
with reports about objects and lights seen in the sky by military personnel and others. The Air Force decided to investigate the matter anyway. There was that one possibility that these flying objects could well be foreign weapons used for test purposes and might affect our national security. The investigative branch was called Project Sign. The project had only been underway for about two weeks when the Mantel crash had made headlines across the nation. The staff's investigation was far from complete, but public pressure was enormous. And they were forced to come up with an answer to really quiet growing speculation that Mantel had been killed by hostile aliens and some flying saucer. That's when we decided that Mantel had chased the planet Venus. However, this was an initial finding. The Chills and Whitted case had an impact on the Air Force project. It presented the first close-up account by highly reliable witnesses. The object described led some of the staff to postulate an extraterrestrial theory. And they wrote up an estimate of the situation, which at the time was classified top secret, suggesting that the saucers were from outer space. This theory was rejected by the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Hoyt Vandenberg, and even other Project Science staff members as not having enough proof. So the extraterrestrial visitation idea was dropped for the time being. It's been said in jest that if these UFOs are from other worlds and they wanted it to be known, all they'd have to do is land on the White House lawn. But an incredible incident too quickly forgotten in time took place over our capital. In 1952, Air Force spokesman for the Pentagon and UFOs at that time, Mr. Al Chop, relates the famous incident that stirred the Capitol, causing a request from even President Truman to be kept up to date on all the details. There were radar reports of unidentified flying objects over the nation's capital. We had three reports. One came from Andrews Air Force Base radar control room, and two from the radar controls at Washington National Airport. The first sightings consisted of a number of unidentified targets picked up on radar. Then a call was placed from National to the Andrews Air Force Base flight controllers. They were apparently tracking the same targets. Then Andrews reported a visual observation of three objects that were apparently in the same position as those indicated by our radar sets. The target stayed on radar until about 12.30 a.m. They moved slowly at first, about 100 to 200 miles per hour. Then one of the targets sped away at a fantastic rate of speed. It moved west from Andrews toward Riverdale. The estimated speed was 7,300 miles per hour. At this time, in the tower, we had about seven targets on the radar scope. These unidentified objects were flying all over the city. They even violated the restricted air corridors here over the White House and over the Capitol building. The phenomena wasn't to subside. The following Saturday night, July 26th, a repeat performance unsettles the Capitol again. I was awakened the following Saturday night around midnight by a telephone call to my home in Virginia. It was the public information officer for the Federal Aviation Authority. He told me the air traffic control radars were again picking up a large number of UFOs over the capital area. First, they would follow a definite flight path, and then they would suddenly disappear. Others would come into view just as suddenly. I placed a phone call to the command post in the Pentagon, and I asked for an intercept. About 2.40 a.m., we got a radio call from a flight of F-94s, two aircraft in the flight. They also, at about that moment, appeared on our scope. And at that moment, a very frightening thing happened to us. All of our unknown traffic completely disappeared the moment those aircraft came on the scope. The flight leader called in and said, well, it doesn't look like we're going to do any good here, so we're going to go back to base. And at the very moment those aircraft disappeared, all of our unknown traffic appeared again on our scope. And again, it was a very frightening experience. We called Andrews Air Force Base, and they reported exactly the same thing happened to their scope. 10 a.m. on the morning after the sighting, 
General Landry, at the request of President Truman, called intelligence to find out what was happening over Washington. It was the largest and longest press conference held in the Pentagon since World War II. General Samford headed the conference and said that he was personally satisfied that the radar scope sightings were the result of temperature inversions, which are known and account for certain blips on radar. Although this was the conclusion of the Air Force investigations, interestingly enough, the actual report begins with this opening comment, a study of the various reports regarding the subject. Radar sightings do not allow a positive and final explanation to be made. The CIA now would enter the picture by convening a panel of top scientists to examine the UFO phenomena. The CIA's concern was that recent waves of sightings might constitute a threat to our national security. The thinking was that the enemy could exploit UFOs as a decoy in the preparation for an attack on the United States. Five outstanding scientists and various Air Force and CIA representatives were to meet on Wednesday, January 14th, 1953. Among the panel members was one associate member who was destined to have more experience with the UFO phenomena than any other American scientist to date. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, astrophysicist and head of the astronomy department of Northwestern University. I was called into the meeting on Thursday. The panel members were seated around this table. It was a rather somber and impressive occasion, actually. I was a junior member, and I remember feeling considerably nervous and apprehensive about being in front of this powerhouse of scientists. But then, for the past four years, I had been scientific advisor to the U.S. Air Force on this very problem. There were two films that were, were of particular interest to the panel at that time. One was a film taken by a Navy officer while on vacation in Utah, near Tremonton, Utah. And the other was a film taken in Great Falls, Montana, by the owner of the local baseball team. The Utah film had already been subjected to some thousand or so man hours of analysis by the Navy's Photographic Interpretation Laboratory. So the panel uh, got up in their chairs and crouched around the walls to examine the films, and they asked to have the films run several times, as a matter of fact. Now, the Navy had, on the basis of their detailed analysis of the Utah films, they had concluded that the objects shown in the films could not be birds, balloons, aircraft, and so forth, but indeed that they were self-luminous, unidentified objects. Despite this conclusion, the panel rejected it and concluded that the objects were birds. They couldn't be unidentified, therefore they had to be birds. I came away from the meeting and from the room with the distinct feeling, however, that the panel had deliberately moved to debunk the whole subject and not to give it the serious scientific attention which it deserved. How many times have you noticed something in the sky, something out of the ordinary, a movement or shape that suddenly catches your attention? You look more closely, and usually, the thing becomes immediately recognizable. It's the moon, or a flock of birds, or a plane, usually. But just for a moment, suppose the thing you glimpsed remains unrecognizable, unidentified, without witness or proof. All you have left is a nagging sense of mystery, of uncertainty. A few years ago, this man had such an encounter near San Francisco. Only he had proof in the form of an eight millimeter movie. But through an unsettling series of circumstances involving the United States Air Force, he remains today uncertain about exactly what he saw. It was in August, 1965. My family and I were invited to some friend's house near San Francisco. I remember it was a beautiful, clear day. We were driving for, for a while and a matter of fact, I recall looking at my watch and it was around noon time. Uh, we continued driving and I noticed at the distance something very bright. I was observing this for a few moments 
and it, it appeared to be suspended in the air. There was no planes around, it was very clear the day, uh, there was no clouds. My family, they were with me, I called to their attention, they all looked at it, they were all amazed by it. And in the meantime, there were cars going by, and I tried to attract their attention, but they were not paying attention to me, or they were driving too fast. So I recall I had my movie camera with me, and I start filming this. And as I look at it, it was getting larger. It was moving from one direction, like from towards the left and towards the right. This object was very bright, and I recall it was extremely enormous. I was just completely amazed by it. I ran out of film, then uh, uh, when I got home, I called uh, Hamilton Air Force, and I reported the sighting. The Air Force was very interested. They had asked me, as soon as I had the film developed, they would like very much to look at it. Well, I had the film developed. I look at it. There it was, very bright, quite clear, and moving very rapidly. So I kept this on, right on film. A week later, I received a letter from Hamilton Air Force Base, which reads, Dear Sir, we have received the 8mm film on which you captured what certainly seems to be a very fast-moving object in the skies over the Bay Area. The film has been forwarded to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, where such observations are investigated. Well, several weeks went by. Finally, the Air Force returned my film. And I noticed immediately it was not the original film. It was not that clear, and the quality was very poor. For some reason, or good reason, the Air Force decided to make a copy. They kept the original, and I end up with a very poor copy. Close examination of the film returned to the Air Force reveals that it is, indeed, a print, and not the original. And while the print is very poor quality, we can still catch a tantalizing glimpse of something extraordinary in the skies over San Francisco. Watching it again, this time with the aid of a pointer, it's easier to spot the elusive thing. But to date, no one has been able to make a positive identification. No one except, possibly, the Air Force. Uh, I would imagine the film is somewhere in their files, and probably by now they forgot all about it. But I will not forget that day the study itself had such profound influence in my life. Because since that time, powerful, extraordinary events has happened to me, which I have no doubt are direct result of my experience. But I, will, I can talk about it publicly. It seems the CIA was to become involved in the UFO phenomena again, in a most unusual way. A series of episodes were to take place that up until the airing of this program were not public knowledge. The events were so bizarre that it's hard to conceive they happened to individuals associated with such no-nonsense organizations as the Office of Naval Intelligence and the CIA. This man is retired Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, U.S. Air Force, and former head of Project Blue Book. Friend, now on the management staff of Celesco Industries Incorporated, which builds and launches missiles for defense testing purposes. Friend now relates this most unusual experience. It was 1959 when I was invited to attend the briefing in the security portion of this building. It seems a retired rear admiral had information about a woman in Upper Maine that purported to have established contact with extraterrestrial beings. Two naval intelligence officers were sent to investigate. The naval officers met with the woman and she went into a trance, supposedly to establish contact with the purported extraterrestrials. And then they asked her scientific and technical questions that a woman of her education could not possibly know the answers to. Yet, as the questions were put to her, she was able to answer easily with seeming telepathic help from these purported extraterrestrials. According to the report, she indicated there was an organization, OEEV, which meant Universal Association of Planets. And that organization had a project, UENZA, meaning Earth, which was being conducted. Then an unexpected turn took place. One of the naval officers was informed by the woman 
that they, the extraterrestrials, were willing to answer questions directly through him, a naval commander and intelligence officer with no prior experience in telepathic communication. He took over and attempted to write down the answers to questions put to him by his fellow naval officer. The word traveled back quickly to Washington officials and a very skeptical CIA. Nevertheless, there was no reason to totally disbelieve the report of this highly respected Navy commander. Questions were put to him, such as, do you favor the government, religious group, or race? And would there be a third world war? The answer to both was no. The group then asked if they could see a spaceship, and the commander, still in a trance, told them to go to the window and they would have proof. The group moved to the window where they supposedly observed a UFO. I was told that a call was made for radar confirmation. The reply came back that that particular quadrant of the area was blanked out on radar at the time. After being briefed on all of the details, I asked the commander if he would attempt to contact me. He sat for several minutes and then appeared in a deep trance with his Adam's apple moving up and down rapidly. Questions were put to him, and he answered them by printing in rather large letters using rapid but jerky motions. It wasn't at all like his natural hand. During the course of the questioning, we learned the names of some of the so-called extraterrestrials. One was Krill, C-R-L-L-L. -L -L. Another, Alamar, a-L-O-M-A-R, and another AFA, A-F-F-A, purportedly from the planet Uranus. A case that just as well could have been written by a very imaginative science fiction writer. But here in my hand is the actual account of the incident by one of the agents present at that time. The names of seven men present are listed here. Because of the unusual nature of the incident and at their request, their names will remain confidential. Another reason for control of the Blue Book files was to protect the names of witnesses. To help satisfy public demand, periodic summary releases were made. We had no proof that we were indeed being visited by extraterrestrial vehicles under intelligent control. However, we couldn't prove that there weren't spaceships either. It created a dilemma for the Air Force. In 1966, an important incident takes place in Michigan. It creates enough of an uproar that President Gerald Ford would at that time call for a congressional hearing on UFOs. Here are excerpts from Ford's actual letter to the House Armed Services Committee. The Air Force sent a consultant, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, to investigate various reports, and he dismissed all of them as products of college student pranks or swamp gas or an impression created by the rising crescent moon and the planet Venus. I do not agree that all of these reports can be or should be so easily explained away. I am proposing that the Science and Astronautics Committee or the Armed Services Committee of the House schedule hearings on the subject of UFOs and invite testimony from both the executive branch of government and some persons who claim to have seen UFOs. I think we owe it to the people to establish credibility regarding UFOs. Sincerely, Gerald R. Ford, Member of Congress. Congress acts on Ford's letter and holds an open hearing under the chairmanship of L. Mendel Rivers of the House Armed Services Committee. Only three persons are invited to testify. The Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, and Project Blue Book head at the time, Colonel Hector Quintanilla. Hector Quintanilla relates the events and reports of the unusual sighting that led up to the congressional hearing. And the other one here at Dexter. Based upon the original reports from the Sheriff's Department, it all began at 8.35 p.m. on March 20th, when Frank Manor, who used to live over there, reported to the Sheriff's office that he had seen a strange object in the swamp over there. According to the police report, the police officer, in company with a complainant, proceeded along Territorial Road until they reached Grant Road, at which time they turned left proceeded to the end of the road, secured their vehicle, got out of the automobile, proceeded along the cornfield, keeping the trees lined to their left. 
Then they crossed an open field to the creek. They crossed the creek and reached this point, which was their vantage point, and observed the object. Frank Manor described the object as brown in color, quilted, with a porthole in the center, sort of flat on the bottom, cone-shaped towards the top, two small lights, one at each end, one glowing bluish green, the other one a brilliant red, with a glow at the bottom. Well, of course, by the time I arrived, the situation was so charged with emotion that it was impossible for me to do any really serious investigating. I had to fight my way through reporters to interview the witnesses. Other sightings were reported over the area, and a solution from Dr. Hynek and Major Quintanella seemed in the offing. Well, the pressure was mounting for an official explanation. There were more than 60 newsmen jammed in at that news conference. I gave what I thought to be at that time the only scientific explanation possible for the faint lights in the swampy area. I made the statement that it could be swamp gas, and even though I went on to emphasize that I couldn't prove it in a court of law, that that was the full explanation for these sightings. Well, the press picked up the phrase swamp gas and rushed off to the telephones and I was to come into a great deal of criticism over it. What was the outcome of that congressional hearing? I believe the Air Force presented its side quite openly and completely. It seemed to satisfy the members of the committee. Now a remarkable observation is to be recorded. If the facts are correct, the Air Force must now consider the possibility of beings related to UFOs. It happened in Socorro, New Mexico, here just outside of this quiet desert town. A state highway patrol officer, Lani Zamora, was on duty, as he had been for the past several years. A black Chevrolet was observed, speeding by the courthouse. Zamora put his highway patrol car into pursuit. Lani chased the car north on US 85. As he passed this hilly area, Zamora heard a roar and something caught his attention. 10 or 15 seconds pass. Lani then calls in to the sheriff's office. The time was about 5.45, I recall. And he said, uh, uh, support to 10.44, an accident. And then he said, I'll be 10 sticks out of the car, which meant that uh, I was going to be investigating a possible accident. And I went up this uh, road uh, about a half a mile, and then I stopped my car and uh, got out and looked out. And I could see a white-looking uh, object in the distance. I thought it was an overturned car at first, uh, but I got into my patrol car and went up closer to it. And uh, when I started to get out of the car, I, could, uh, I heard a big roar. As I got to it, I could see... Uh, a couple of, uh, looked like a couple of uh, coveralls uh, hanging from a clothesline. I couldn't see what it was, but it looked like a couple of coveralls. Samora called in. Uh, he sounded very excited. He said he watched an object uh, lift up slowly and disappeared into the uh, sky very fast. I went down to uh, where the object had been, and I noticed the brush was burning in several places. The uh, object had left four perpendicular impressions on the ground. I noticed that uh, several bushes were smoldering, but they felt cold to the touch. I noticed what appeared to be a couple of oval uh, footprints on the ground. I knew Lonnie had seen something. The proof was right there. The incident was very interesting, to say the least. It seems to differ from practically all the earlier cases we investigated from one standpoint. The vehicle had left pod marks. There was an insignia observed by Lani Zamora on the side of the craft. The insignia was unidentifiable, not American, nor Russian. And last of all, the observation of these two people in some sort of suit. But what did the investigation turn up? What was the official Air Force estimation of the situation? We went over the case completely. We had saw samples tested at the Air Materials Laboratory. The burnt bushes were analyzed for propellant residue. We measured the distances between the pod marks. My first reaction 
was that it was a lunar test module from NASA or the Air Force. That seems to be the only logical explanation. This was probably the best documented case in the Air Force files, and I checked it out everywhere, all the way up to the top, even to the White House command post, and nothing. According to the official status of the sighting of Lonnie Zamora, case carried as unidentified, pending additional data. April 19th, 1897, in Leroy, Kansas, a farmer named Alexander Hamilton, his son, and a farmhand are awakened by strange noises from the cattle pen. Going outside, they discover, to Hamilton's utter amazement, an enormous airship with a brilliant searchlight, is slowly descending over the cow lot. Fearfully, Hamilton moves closer and is startled to find that one of his cows has been caught by a red cable running down from the ship. The next day, after an extensive search, he discovers the cow's hide, legs, and head in a field miles away. This is one of the first recorded cattle mutilations connected with UFOs. The report could easily be dismissed as a tall tale if there were no others. But since then, thousands of bizarre animal mutilations have been discovered, not only in this country, but in Africa, Australia, Brazil, and many European countries, in fact, all over the world. In this country, mutilations have occurred in over 30 states in the last five years alone. Frustrated ranchers and law enforcement officials have come to recognize the classic signature of the mysterious mutilators. Often, in a remote area, a cow will be found dead, the sex organs removed, and the tongue, an ear, and an eye all surgically cut out. The body, more often than not, has been drained of blood, though no blood has been found on the ground. In fact, there are no tracks or prints of any kind near the body. And yet, amazingly enough, there is no evidence of a struggle. One of the first states to be hit by the mutilations was Colorado. Reporter Bill Jackson of the Sterling Advocate covered the story from the very beginning. A classic mutilation, or, or say uh, 90 to 95 percent of the mutilations will be almost identical. Some part of the face will be gone, exposing nothing but you know, the jawbone. An eye will be taken, a tongue will be cut out, and an ear will be taken. The rectal area of the animal will be what appears to be bored out. Uh, the reproductive organs will be removed. In the case of a cow, the udder will either be entirely removed or parts of it will be removed. Usually, uh, in, again, in probably 90 or 95 percent of the cases, there will be no blood whatsoever in the animal and there will be no traces of blood on the ground where it, where it fell or where it was mutilated. All you've got is the carcass and you've got no idea of why it died or how it died or how it was mutilated. Or it all began in 1975. It was a bizarre time. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. Not only did we have the, the mutilated dead animals on the prairie, but we also started getting the lights in the sky at night. Along that time, there were many theories that were being developed on why this was being done. The satanic cults were being blamed, dope smugglers, UFOs, a government experiment of some kind. As time went on, the situation became so widespread that people realized it couldn't be the, uh, the old cult or the dope smugglers, which left us two possibilities. Number one, it was being done by a government, let's say. Or number two, it was being done by UFOs. As more and more cases were reported, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation was called in. Well, our position is basically one uh, where predators, at least our investigation determined that predators were responsible for probably 99% of the reports of mutilations. As I said, there were 203 separate reports received from this agency. But of the 203, we only received 45 tissue samples to conduct microscopic analysis on. Of the 45 tissue samples, we found that only two of those 45 had actually been mutilated with a sharp instrument. 
when they first started, they would send samples of these animals to the CBI, to Fort Collins, to, to try and determine what, what was the cause of their death, what was mutilating them. And nine times out of ten or more, the report would come back that were being caused by predators. Now, these ranchers and, and the sheriffs in these rural areas had been around cattle all their lives. They'd been around coyotes all their lives. And they knew that this, this just wasn't possible. A coyote would not do that. Predators, uh, uh, when they come in and start to eat, now I'm, and I'm talking about four-legged predators, uh, they'll come in and they'll bite and then they'll pull and they'll tear. Uh, the, uh, the cuts we have, even we can't make cuts like this. We've tried this many times and all on dead animals with scalpels, razors, and knives, and we can't make the same cuts. We've had cattle that we've went and investigated that were, you know, called in, and I think I have a mutilation here, and we went out and we seen it, and it was not a mutilation. And these are not the ones that's reported. The ones that we classed as a classic type mutilation are actually mutilations, and they're not predators. Animals, wild animals, predators, coyotes, uh, won't approach these, these carcasses. But in the case of an animal being mutilated in the wintertime, there's possibly something about the cold weather that may mask whatever it is that keeps predators away, and that will be the exception to the rule. Is this animal here is any, uh, pretty much like the other ones you had that was mutilated? Yeah. Yeah. How old a cow is this, Don? Eight years old, according to the way I looked at her, her teeth, to eight or nine. I know uh, definitely it wasn't uh, animals. We took out the whole works there. Don, you know now on this critter here. Well, this looks like a real incised wound. Yeah. Well, it looks it's definitely cut. Oh, yeah. And everything you can tell that. I mean, even at the age that it is right now, that's opposed to the way it is to where the animals have been to it on this other side over here. Kind of notice there, you know, the difference there, Don, between here yeah. and how animals have been to that and that flesh is torn. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not a real incised. But yet, when we seen this animal the other day, now these were all that's incise. Right good clean cuts on Definitely. it. Definitely. So that's a good example of what we was trying to say about the lab up there. They said that uh, they said it was predators doing it, but that definitely wasn't a predator wound there. No, I wouldn't say. Uh... Well, it looks like uh, they went clear from the navel. Here, turned back in underneath here and took the whole bag and out of the whole works out. And uh, they cored down into the rectum, the whole rectal area. It looks like it got back into some of the reproductive organs back in there. The mutilation and the, and the sightings of the lights in the sky continued. It got to a point to where more ranchers in the northeastern part of the state began arming themselves. They weren't getting the results they wanted from state authorities. They were concerned for their families, and they never knew when they might be next. They began patrolling their pasture land, watching over their herds at night lights from the sky when they got too close to a herd of cattle. The ranchers shot. Well, I think everybody was a little edgy. Right. Uh, everybody <laughs> everybody started carrying high-powered rifles. I don't know what good it would have done, but uh, everybody was awfully nervous. I'm completely convinced that there's something there that's not normal. There's a lot of questions that are unanswered, I'm sure, and hopefully someday maybe somebody will figure it out. Unidentifiable lights in the sky have appeared in virtually every area of this country which has been plagued by cattle mutilations. But no explanation has been found for these strange sightings. There are some who believe that these objects in the sky are responsible for thousands of mysterious cattle deaths which continue to this day. Though state and local officials have stated their views about the mutilation mystery, Surprisingly, few veterinarians will speak publicly about the situation. This man is an exception. Dr. William Fitzgerald runs an animal clinic in Durango, Colorado. Because of his expertise in the field of veterinary medicine, he was asked by the sheriff's office to perform an autopsy on a mutilated cow found in a remote area of state-owned forest. 
this particular animal had been largely exsanguinated. The anus and about the first four inches of the rectum had been removed. The prepucial skin and the last two or three inches of the penis had been severed flush with the body wall. The left eye had been removed and the last one third of the tongue had been cut. A portion of the lips on the left side of the animal were also sawed off, uh, presumably to gain access to the tongue, but this makes no sense because that portion of the tongue could have been easily pulled out and cut off without that, so I, I don't understand that point. Reports I have heard, uh, some that I have read uh, subsequent to this time, indicate that people have seen mutilations that they attributed to predators. And if this was a predator, he had two feet and a six inch knife because it was a very sharp, single cut in most instances. And although not the world's leading expert, I work with knives frequently. I know what they do. I know the marks they leave. Exsanguination, the removal of blood from an animal has been a predominant trademark of the mutilators. Few officials have found an answer to the technique used in this procedure. Dr. Fitzgerald describes what he thinks is the method. If a large bore needle is placed in the animal's jugular vein while the animal is sedated under anesthesia or awake if you like, somehow restrained however, the animal's heart will function as a pump and will pump out very nearly all of its blood through that needle. As the animal's blood supply begins to diminish, a natural physiological mechanism takes over and sequesters or draws what remaining blood is left into the internal organs in the center to supply the vital organs, the liver, the heart, the brain. And it will leave the peripheral area, the skin, uh, all of the non-vital centers, largely bloodless. So if you can successfully withdraw the major portion of an animal's blood, you can cut on that animal and there will be virtually no bleeding at all from the surface. I know that I keep coming back to this point, but the animal was apparently restrained with something other than ropes. Why, I don't know. It was apparently washed completely clean. Why, I don't know. Uh, and it was in a very remote area. Perhaps these things tie together. Perhaps whoever, whatever, performed this didn't want to be observed. Uh, I think one of my initial feelings was that Somebody certainly went to an awful lot of trouble to get back into a remote area where I don't believe you'd casually know there were even cattle to do all of this. Dulce, New Mexico. Similar to the plains of Colorado in its isolation, but nestled among rolling hills and small mountains. It is the land of the Hikaria Apache. Tradition is strong here. Indian women weave intricate baskets and create delicate beadwork. The men preside over tribal business and raise cattle. And here, as in Logan County, the night sky has been lit with the glow of unknown flying objects and cattle are found mutilated. Officer Gabe Valdez of the New Mexico State Police and retired scientist Howard Burgess, who pioneered the development of Curlian photography in this country, periodically pool their knowledge and expertise in an effort to solve the mutilation mystery. Officer Valdez describes how it all began. It was in 1976, uh, June the 14th, uh, we, when we first had uh, one of our cattle mutilations here in Dulce. Uh, the cattle uh, that was mutilated belonged to Mr. Manuel Gomez. Any time that we do find one that uh, it's not too decomposed and it's uh, it's uh, fresh enough for us to do some tests. Well, I do call on Mr. Burgess because he, he has a lot of knowledge in the field of science that is uh, very helpful to me in conducting my investigations. 
Howard Burgess had a theory that some of the cattle had been marked prior to their mutilation with something which would show up under ultraviolet light but be invisible to the naked eye. Late one night, he and Valdez conducted an experiment and found that out of 80 head of cattle, five were indeed marked with a powdery white substance visible only under ultraviolet light. So we took uh, ultraviolet with some special filters and ran the cattle through it and what appears to be markings glowed under ultraviolet. It's invisible to the normal eye, but under ultraviolet it does glow. Then we removed the hair from the region that does glow and we removed a control sample. We took these to the lab and had chemical checks run on them. We did find that the uh, sample that did glow is extremely high in potassium and magnesium. At the time, this was interesting, but it didn't mean much to us until we ran on to other things that <laughs> began to tie in with it. The tie-in came on June 3, 1978, when a UFO was sighted over Taos, New Mexico. As it hovered over the town, it dropped a thin film of ashes onto the ground below. The ashes contained high levels of magnesium and potassium, the same elements found on the cattle under ultraviolet light, but there was more. We find there's at least 25 elements in there. There's a good possibility that it may be something that's organic. And if it is, this just opens up a real bag of worms because anything can happen if this is an organic material that has come from one of these crafts. And this, as the people told us, directly fell from the craft that was hovering over the area. One day in 1975, Logan County Sheriff Tex Graves took his deputies into the countryside around Sterling, Colorado, determined to track the bright lights which had been skimming across the ranches and farmlands for the last several weeks. Reporter Bill Jackson describes the sequence of events. We were just getting started in this. We really didn't know what we were doing. We weren't prepared for anything like this, of course. But as, as time went on, we realized we couldn't catch them. So maybe we can take pictures of them and discover something that way. A year and a half later, uh, the lights returned and the mutilations were still going on. So we, uh, we arranged with the Honeywell people in Denver to borrow a 1100 uh, millimeter Lentar lens from them. And I got some high speed recording film from Kodak. And then we sat and we waited, uh, hoping that the, the lights would come back and we'd have a chance. And finally that, that chance came. It was a stationary object that we saw for approximately 30 to 45 minutes, and the resulting shots were interesting, to say the least. Shortly after these final exposures, the object just disappeared. It was almost like somebody hit a, a light switch and it was there no longer. What are these unidentifiable lights? What is their nature and their purpose? Why have they appeared in the night skies immediately prior to the discovery of mutilated cattle? And how many more animals will die before the mystery is solved? In 1974, I received a call from a woman who had a strange story to tell. One night, as she and three friends were returning to Los Angeles from Lompoc, California, they encountered an unidentified light in the sky. Thinking at first it was a helicopter, the friends paid little attention. When the object began to fly in unusual patterns at extremely high speeds, the passengers soon realized they were dealing with something out of the ordinary. What happened next is best told in the woman's own words. Helen is a fictional name. Her real name is being withheld at her own request. I saw a tremendous sky from the top of the mountain range and it goes straight up and do a 90 degree angle toward us and I called it to the attention of Don, John and Sue. And they saw it too. 
and it was there. I was not a dope or alcohol or anything like that. And it came starting doing really erratic things in the sky. It was a small white light and very easy to see. We were not mistaking anything. It came over to the car, looked over and went around on the other side of the, toward the other hills and came back, settled above the car. By this time, because it was so close, it was eight lanes freeway, at least in diameter and even a little wider, saucer shaped, a very white luminescent light emitted from the entirety of it. The ship stayed above us, out in front of us, about um, a minute or two, and we watched it, and none of us were saying a thing. And uh, we just kept driving, and it kept staying in front of us. And then out of the perimeter of it, closest to us, came four white beams of light, very much like funnel-shaped, smaller at the perimeter, and they descended upon us and came around each one of our bodies. And out of each one of our bodies, we started to float into that beam of light. The best description would, would be molecularly being dispersed. And um, when I looked over at Don and Sue and John, their bodies, their, their legs and their bottoms are still on the car seat, and their heads and their shoulders and their chest molecules were going through the roof of the car, along with mine. We didn't lose consciousness while this happened. We were completely conscious of going through the roof. And the bottom molecules of our body were coming through, too, when we were about three and a half or four feet outside the car going toward the ship, and we hit an energy field, a strong one, and remembered nothing. Next thing I did remember, we were coming back, the same process, going back into the car. It wasn't until several years later that Helen realized she had experienced more than she remembered. Mental images, which she couldn't explain, caused her to visit a specialist who put her through a memory regression. In this relaxed state, Helen recalled the evening in question and described in detail the experience of being taken aboard the UFO. I came to, and standing in front of me was a very tall man with whitish hair, kind of bronze, beautifully tan type of skin. And um, he had long type of roguish gown on and he was looking at me and very very friendly and he said it he supposed i'd like to know what we were doing here and i looked around and i did want to know there was a huge room that we were in that had a hallway off the front and a hallway off to the side and there were round curved hallways the room was very light uh iridescent light radiated all over but you didn't see a light bulb anywhere in fact you didn't see hardly anything except for the swivel chairs we were sitting in and he proceeded to help me up, and then we walked together over to the screen in front of us, across the room, and he showed us some information, pictures, and it was very cordial and very easy to talk with. The man spoke to me in English, but concurrent with everything he said was a great, de great deal of telepathic communication, and it was completely peaceful feeling. There, it all made sense. He showed us a screen with many images on it that clarified some of the things he was saying. He also said that he'd been around with the other people there for thousands of years and that they had been picking up people and giving information to people for the use of putting it into this world, into this society, to bring about a lot of better changes. And the interesting thing was that um, there are some people, he indicated, who have, who we know and read about, who were given information by him. This is what he told me. And um, there was no fear. That's predominant, I think, in everything. From this large room where we first came on, the man led me down into a couple other rooms. And the one that's very interesting was more or less in the center of this ship, and it was a room full of dials and full of men dressed in more form-fitting clothes, whereas the one who met me had a type of ambassadorial robes on. And these guys had more like turtlenecks and Levi's. They were still white, soft, iridescent, and very comfortable looking. And they were working. There was plenty of dials, and there was lots of screens, types of scopes there. And they were doing things um, very involved. And none of them paid any attention to us. They kept their work. After he had taken me to these rooms, we were walking again down the hall to go back to the car. 
And while we were walking, I remember telling him, you know, nobody's going to believe me. And he said, it's really nice to talk to you. And he goes, it doesn't matter if anybody believes you. And there was a purpose to being told these things. And what I had learned and what John and Sue had learned, too, had its purpose. And it was very kind and very cordial. You could meet him on the street almost and not even feel anything unusual. And then we came back to the room. We were put back in the car the same way as we were taken out. And we just this tremendous sense of peace and that there was a lot more going on than, than we had originally thought. In December of 1969, amidst great public controversy, the Condon report from the University of Colorado was finally out. In summary, they found no evidence that UFOs were a threat to the national security, and the late Dr. Condon recommended that the Air Force terminate its involvement in UFO investigations and analysis. In 1969, the Air Force officially disbanded Project Blue Book and the study of the UFO phenomenon. The conclusions of Project Blue Book were, one, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. Two, there is no evidence submitted that sightings categorized as unidentified represent technological developments or principles beyond the range of present-day scientific knowledge. And three, there is no evidence indicating that these unidentified objects are extraterrestrial. The files of over 12,000 cases were placed into storage. But the ubiquitous UFO wasn't to be influenced by this government position. Incidents were to continue, with daily reports of flying objects finding their way into the news media. In the closing months of 1973 and early into 1974 alone, there are over 1,000 unrelated and unsolved reports of UFOs from across the United States. Delaware State News, Dover, Delaware, October the 16th, 1973. Dover, three women on their way to the market saw it. At the same time, the crew of the Delaware State Police helicopter saw it. Two airline pilots flying over Dover reportedly saw it. Flight controllers at the Dover Air Force Base saw it. Southern Illinois, from Carbondale, Illinois, October 18th, 1973. It didn't make any noise, Don said. It had red and green flashing lights on the front and back. Times Dispatch, Richmond, Virginia, October the 19th, 1973. It was hovering, and we parked there on US Route 15 about two hours and watched it. Walla Walla, Washington, January 30th, 1974. Guards of the Washington State Penitentiary have spotted what appears to be the same UFO two mornings in a row from their tower positions at the prison. Scranton Tribune, Scranton, Pennsylvania, February the 25th, 1974. Police spot flying object. State's UFO reports are increasing. October 21st, 1978. Bass Trade, Tasmania. A pilot named Frederick Valentich disappears after reporting a strange craft hovering above him. December 12, 1978, La Chapelle, France. A 45-year-old worker riding home observes an oval object. Together with another witness, he sees a craft hover above them. December 12, 1978, Guadalajara, Mexico. Two luminous saucer-shaped objects are reported by residents, then by a police officer. December 16, 1978, Palermo, Italy. A bank clerk spots a disk of light and alerts the police who take several photographs. January 2nd, 1979, Wellington, New Zealand. A veteran pilot and a newsman film seven objects. January 4th, 1979, Jerusalem. Police on duty see three mysterious objects at high altitude. January 5th, 1979, Johannesburg, South Africa. A woman and her son report seeing half a dozen occupants in front of a brightly colored craft on the lonely country road. Ordinary people are seeing something all over the globe. But what have the experts seen? NORAD and the Air Force do have extremely sophisticated equipment. And by use of the phased array radar facility, surveillance is maintained on objects in space. But the system is only designed to track things like rockets 
satellites, and man-made debris, objects with specific trajectories, and which hold an orbital or flight velocity of approximately 4.8 nautical miles per second. This system is designed to discriminate between objects in space. For example, it will ignore a meteor entering the Earth's atmosphere, but will quickly spot a satellite as it begins re-entry. Objects can also be photographed with incredible precision by the electro-optical surveillance system, and it's very good at its job. However, it's not designed to photograph everything, just specific items and particular missions. The sky is so vast, it is virtually impossible to wait for, track, and photograph all unidentified phenomena. There is just not sufficient time or budget. So it is not really accurate to say that our sophisticated equipment and personnel are able to identify and examine any and all UFOs. On the contrary, they are programmed to study man-built machines and only that. Among the many reports of UFOs in late 1973, one incident would stand out because of the credibility of the four witnesses. This is Major Coyne, Army helicopter pilot, his co-pilot, Lieutenant Arrigo Jetsi, Air Medic Sergeant Healy, and Robert Janicek. These men had just finished their annual flight physical early that day and were found fit and sound of mind. They would take off from Port Columbus Airport about 10.30 p.m. But what was about to follow and the subsequent report they filed would put to the test the credibility of these men. Approximately eight miles east of Mansfield, our uh, crew chief, Sergeant Robert Janicek, observed a red light on the east horizon. Our did you gentlemen see the same red light? Yes, I did. Our helicopter was flying on a northerly heading. We were flying at an altitude of 2,500 feet. Uh, he indicated that the light seemed to be facing the helicopter, moving along in a parallel direction with our aircraft. Which direction from the helicopter was he at? Uh, moving, it was, in the, it was to our right, to the right side of the helicopter. And it was moving with us as we were heading north towards Cleveland. And at this time, uh, he indicated that the light changed its direction was coming directly at the helicopter at the same altitude. And as the helicopter uh, was maintaining a speed of 90 knots, the object came at a terrific speed from the horizon. We estimated 15 miles. Visibility was reported 15 miles that night. Did you gentlemen see the object at this time after it had been pointed out by the uh, sergeant? No, not at that time. I was flying left seat or co-pilot, and visibility from that seat from, from an object approaching from the right is rather limited. So I was having uh, a difficulty seeing the object. And it was that for that reason that Major Coyne did take the aircraft or the controls from me. I grabbed the controls from Lieutenant Jetsy because I thought it was going to hit us. I braced for impact. With that, I pushed the collective down to get the helicopter to start to descend. I then looked at the altimeter. It was showing 1,700 feet. We were descending 1,000 feet a minute. The helicopter began to descend. And as this object came at the helicopter, it seemed to descend with the helicopter. When the helicopter went down, the object came down, but still came directly at our broadside, as if to hit the helicopter from the right side. Did anyone else see the object at this time? Yes, I was watching it come on out of the east horizon. And uh, the only thing I felt was when uh, the skipper took over the controls and we started to auto-rotate down. And I'd never been involved in a mid-air collision, so I was just watching this thing come at us. It was at this time a light came, swung 90 degrees from the UFO towards the helicopter. And it came in through the front of the plexiglass and the entire cabin inside turned green from the light. It was a pyramid-shaped type of light that beamed down and came through the front of the helicopter. How long was your aircraft bathed in uh, this beam? The light uh, that came into the cockpit apparently lasted only for a few seconds, but it was enough time that I observed the red instrument panel lights utilized for night flying to be absorbed by the green light. Was it possible for you to determine the outline of this object against the star background? Yes, sir. It was a cigar-shaped object, like a symmetrical airfoil with the dome on it. It was a solid object. It was a metallic structure to it. 
and uh, you could see lights reflecting off the structure, you could, and you could not see any of the stars or uh, behind the object itself. Well, while all this was going on, uh, what was the attitude of the helicopter? Apparently, when we were supposed to be descending at 2,000 feet a minute at 100 knots, we were climbing at 1,000 feet a minute with the control still established for a descent. And it, we went from 1,700 feet up to 3,500 feet and topped out at 3,800 feet. I would like to stress one important fact, and that is there is approximately 20 years of Army aviation experience between the four men on board the helicopter that night. We have been trained to follow procedures and regulations in reporting incidents, regardless of how they're accepted. And we tried to follow those procedures. And we reported the incident as it occurred and have avoided any speculation on the subject. Well, our government's official position is not to speculate on this subject. We can choose to let our minds explore other possibilities, to use our imaginations. For if we consider that astro scientists agree on one point, that the possibility of life elsewhere is not only quite probable, some feel it is there without a doubt. Let us suppose then that these objects are real space vehicles, extraterrestrial in origin, and not an illusion of the mind. Perhaps we can begin to accept such ideas as various reported UFO shapes and configurations by looking at our own aviation history. We have, in 71 years, devised dozens of aircraft shapes. From propeller-driven biplanes to lunar modules to date. And by projecting into the future, it's conceivable that our technology may lead us to similar developments. As to the UFO's behavior, if they are space vehicles, they appear to have movement in advance of our understanding of what is possible in the 20th century. But we must realize, however, it stretches our imagination. There will be a 21st, and 22nd, and 23rd century, where the impossibilities of today may be tomorrow's commonplace. If these vehicles are of origins outside our Earth, then we must assume they are managed, controlled, and operated by some sort of beings, perhaps similar to us. From sketchy reports around the world, we can begin to construct a hazy portrait of these aliens. Reports indicate ashen, pale, white skin, perhaps with a thin protective membrane over them. Eyes large, far apart, with a wraparound appearance. Nose indefinite, two small breathing holes. A slit mouth, or small, or no opening at all. Behavior cautious, curious firm, ability to paralyze on touch, sounds emitted, mm, humming, ooze in a foreign language or some accent, buzzing as if electronic from their head and chest, wearing head protection or overall body protection. We just might not be scientific and technically sophisticated to the extent that's necessary in order to recognize what is the real evidence in this in, the, in what we have collected. I think we should also think of other possible hypotheses. Suppose there are such things as uh, um, interlocking universes, where uh, forms of matter which don't mesh with ours except under uh, strange conditions. To assume that we are on the level of intelligence that, a, that would of necessity be visiting us if they have the ability to come here uh, there may be no common bridge of understanding. Uh, there may be attempts at communication and we don't recognize it as communication. We must always be aware of the fact that we may be testing the wrong hypothesis. As for instance, in the days when people talked about stones falling from heaven, uh, that was testing the wrong hypothesis. Meteorites do exist. The phenomenon exists, but they're not stones that fall from heaven. They're stones that the Earth collides with when they're in orbit around the sun. It's arrogant, egocentric, egotistical for us to think that we are the highest intelligences in the universe. I think that's completely preposterous. 
As far as the extraterrestrial intelligence is concerned, I believe it's out there. We have not been able to come up with a logical explanation. At least our scientists have not. Uh, the only plausible explanation that does, that would explain all of these sightings is the theory that these could be intelligently controlled vehicles uh, controlled by an alien species, alien to this planet. How would the public react if this event were true? To find the answer, Dr. Leon Festinger of the New School for Social Research consulted a number of prominent social psychologists from several universities across the United States. You must realize that social scientists can only make educated guesses about reactions to such a new and startling event. But nevertheless, certain behavior can be predicted. Dr. Aronson of the University of Texas points out that many people already have strong beliefs about the existence or non-existence of extraterrestrial beings and are committed to these beliefs. Dr. Walser tells us that if these extraterrestrial beings were advanced beyond us, we would probably gain technological information from them, that many Americans may worry that their benefactor will demand something in return, constant gratitude or acknowledgement of their superiority. As far as panic is concerned, most of my associates agree that it wouldn't happen unless there were one in imminent danger with no escape or chance to protect oneself and two, it resulted in loss of contact with family or primary groups. And last, there is also the question of longer term effects. What would happen over many years? One social psychologist suggests that it might help to unite the world. If the visitors from space prove to be an enemy, he suggests, then we would unite as one species to drive the invader away and then to live in peace thereafter. We've so far talked of the past and the present, but what are the possibilities of the future? It seems almost certain that if other beings more advanced than ourselves do inhabit other sectors of the universe, then it's quite probable there will come that day, that moment in time, when official contact will be made. Let's look at an incident that might happen in the future, or perhaps could have happened already. The premise is that contact is made by extraterrestrial beings with representatives of the United States Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base in the deserts of New Mexico. The day is clear. It's about 5.32 a.m. at Holloman Air Force Base. Traffic light. One recon plane is on the field ready for takeoff when Sergeant Mann is given a report of an approaching unidentified craft. Yeah, Bill, uh, no, nothing on the seven turn left. I'll repeat it again. Uh, Unidentified approaching objects on 49er, 34 degrees southwest, while I'm waiting for a land. Uh, probably a stray civilian, maybe. Uh, keep me informed. I see them over there. Check with Edwards. Make contact with them, Bill. Uh, this is Holloman Air Force Base Control Tower. Identify yourself. What's your tail number? You're encroaching on military airspace. Warning, identify yourself. You're in a restricted military Call the base commander. Base commander's office, Sergeant Wentworth speaking. Yes? Yes, hold on. Colonel, for you. This is Colonel Horner, yes? Yes, an unidentified vehicle. You warned the aircraft again? Turn What's it? Shape? Check Edwards. Civilian patrol. Okay, all right. Uh, it's down to red alert. Unidentified aircraft approaching. Hey, Bill, give me a quick check with Wright Patterson Intelligence. There may be an experimental craft from somewhere, I don't know, here. Alert the fire chief and security and safety. Interceptors are dispatched to escort the unidentified crafts out of the area. During a routine photographic mission, a tech sergeant and staff sergeant of the base photographic team were aboard a helicopter at the time and run off several feet of film 
of the three objects, one of which breaks away and begins a descent. A second high-speed camera crew on the ground runs off approximately 600 feet. The cameras continue to roll as the extraordinary vehicle comes into view. It hovers almost silently about 10 feet off the ground for nearly a minute and yaws like a ship at anchor, then sets down on three extension pads. Commander and two officers, along with two base Air Force scientists, arrive and wait apprehensively. A panel slides open on the side of the craft, stepping forward, one, then two, and a third, what appear to be men dressed in tight-fitting jumpsuits, perhaps short by our standards, with an odd blue-gray complexion, eyes set far apart, a large pronounced nose, they wear a headpiece that resembles a rope-like design. The commander and the two scientists step forward to greet the visitors. Arrangements are made by some sort of communication, and the group quickly retires to an inner office in the King One area. Left behind stand a stunned group of military personnel. Who the visitors are, where they're from, and what they want is unknown. We now have a new challenge, perhaps the most monumental in recorded history. The opportunity to investigate a phenomenon that could change our destiny. Through the study and understanding of the UFO phenomena, we may discover a new energy force, or how to use it, or it could lead to an understanding of our relationship to life throughout the universe. And if there are beings from distant advanced societies, we may be privileged to see a revelation a look at ourselves a thousand years in the future. And perhaps at this very moment, located in another galaxy, somewhere in infinite space, other beings raise similar questions and discuss the possibilities of life outside their planet and talk about Earth as part of their plans for the near future. <laughs>